And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning and happy Monday, Lena. Happy Monday, back at the grind. <laughs> yes, I'm feeling more fatigued than usual. <laughs> well, that's because my, perhaps the news cycle never stopped working throughout the entire yeah. weekend. It, it, yeah, it went hard. Um, in our world news today, we'll talk about the Republican primary uh, in Korea. I think the biggest headline is probably the medical tensions. It never yeah. stopped, and we're already a week into it. Let's get started. Mm -hmm. That's our first keyword of the day. Medical tensions. So the presidential office has reaffirmed its decision to maintain the expansion of medical school admissions by 2000, dismissing any possibility of compromise with uh, protesting doctors. Now, doctors are not backing down. They're seen chanting over the weekend, we're not criminals, don't treat us like one, in response to the government's accusation of holding patients hostage. Yeah, so the top office labeled the protests as extreme actions that gamble with patients' lives. On the other side, medical associations vowed to resist to the end. And as you said, the KMA, uh, the largest doctors group, held a rally over the weekend expressing their adamant opposition. Now, this firm stance from both sides suggests uh, the dispute might, of course, drag on causing more chaos in medical services. Uh, the director of national policy at the presidential office said the decision was reached after making various projections, adding it is non-negotiable. The top office spokesperson, Kim uh, Sukyun, countered the claim that the government had not engaged in proper dialogue before the decision to raise the med school quota. She said about 130 consultations have actually taken place before the ultimate decision was made. Now, what to say, the office seems to be Leveraging the kind of high public support for the expansion plan with a detailed kind of rebuttal to the medical community's opposition and drawing a line against any concessions, as well as ramping up pressure uh, on the medical community um, as well. Now, another official from the office told reporters that while the government is open to dialogue, 2,000 in terms of the quota is the minimum number after making concessions. So they're not going to go any lower uh, than that. So that number is pretty much set. They initially were uh, thinking about 3,000, but after consultations and gathering opinions, they set the number at 2,000 minimum. Uh, the office also mentioned that if the upcoming survey among the 40 national medical schools falls short of the 2,000 target, uh, establishing new regional medical schools will also be considered as well. So even if it takes um, building new schools, they're going to stick to that number. Now, in the midst of ongoing disruptions in the medical services, there's great concern that Resident doctors currently working may also leave their positions by the end of this month. Uh, so we could expect more residents and trainee doctors to be leaving their posts. Uh, to gauge how bad the situation is, the Prime Minister Handok Su has visited a military hospital um, in Songnam to check on the emergency medical services as well. But um, it's not looking good at the moment. So, mm -hmm. yeah, both sides putting their feet down. Uh, no wiggle room really from either side yeah. uh, to kind of make concessions so um it's going to be a tough long drawn out battle between the two sides they left a tiny tiny door open saying that both sides are willing to at one point sit down for discussions which point i i, I don't i wouldn't know when to tell you um we'll have yeah. to wait and see in the meantime it seems the prime minister visited the military hospital to ensure that you know emergency care is well taken care of i mean that was a back a plan all along utilizing military hospitals but you're right um this does there, there just doesn't seem to be an end or a resolution in close sight yeah i mean they can both sides can be willing to sit down for talks but just will anything come out <laughs> so will, but will anything come out of those talks mm -hmm. if they do sit down because they're pretty much um adamant on their respective positions so yeah even if they do hold dialogues uh, not much will come out of them is the main as the majority expectation at the moment all right let's turn our attention to our second keyword of the day russian sanctions how does it affect uh south korean companies our second keyword of the day it's on probe. So a particular South Korean company is reportedly under investigation by authorities for its alleged connection to Russia after being sanctioned by the United States. Can you tell us the details? Right. So the firm in question is Tesong International Trading and Seoul's Trade Ministry and Customs Agency are said to be examining whether the company's uh, transactions 
uh, violated laws such as the Foreign Trade Act. Now, they plan to impose sanctions if any illegal activities are discovered. They're also said to be sharing information with the U.S. Uh, in terms of their investigation. Now, the U.S. Department of Commerce included 93 companies in its entity list as part of sanctions against Russia on the second anniversary of the Ukraine conflict. This list is for foreign companies or institutions that the U.S. thinks are harmful to its national security. Among these companies was Tezong International Trade that is located in Kime. A government official said that although Tezong is registered in South Korea, its CEO is actually from Pakistan. Uh, the U.S. Bureau of Industry and Security said these companies help Russia's industrial sector by getting U.S.-made tools and equipment without permission from the BIS. So if there's any companies um, on this list uh, or any, uh, if they want to do any business with um, businesses that have any links or sanctions, uh, Russian businesses, they need permission mm. from the BIS. Now, South Korea has also updated the list of controlled exports to include 682 more items to help with international efforts against Russia uh, and Belarus. Uh, meanwhile, the US also put sanctions on a company in Ireland that is uh, run by two Korean nationals. Uh, it's called Cubit Semiconductor. It was listed by, by the US for sending electronic parts to the sanctioned Russian semiconductor company JCS Micron. JSC Micron, rather, multiple times. Now, one of the firm's directors said the components were semiconductor parts and were not for military use, saying it hasn't really been helping with the Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. So, mm. yeah, there's um, some Korean uh, companies that mm. involve some Korean people and the entities mm. in question when it comes to uh, this whole sanctioning of Russian companies. All right, we'll have to wait and see. Now, let's take a look at how consumption habits have changed since uh, steep rate hikes began. Our third keyword of the day. Low consumption. So due to the impact of high inflation and interest rates, private consumption continues to be sluggish. It's been found that those in their 30s and 40s especially who bought homes with loans have cut their spending the most after interest rate hikes. I guess that makes sense if you have less money to spend and a, a hefty yeah. loan to pay back. You would you would um, yeah. spend less, essentially. Uh, yeah, I mean, this whole this whole story is pretty much obvious, but it's just got numbers <laughs> well, we involved. We just have numbers. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just a bit more precise and specific. Uh, and there was a report by the VOK uh, say that when interest rates rise by one percentage point, uh, household consumption growth decreases by 0.32 percentage points. Now, as interest rates rise, people are saving more and cutting down on uh, current spending, uh, which is obvious. But this, there's a phenomenon in economics known as intertemporal substitution. Uh, I won't go into too much of uh, you know economics uh, theories uh, with this, but that is what it's known as. Um, now, consumption is down across the board, actually, regardless of what people are buying or actually their personal circumstances. Also, families are saving a higher percentage of their income than before. Plus, people are shifting their money into savings or bonds that pay interest and reducing their debts that cost them uh, interest as well. The BOK found that those who have more debt than assets uh, that earn interest were mostly in their 30s um, and 40s. Now, when compared to families that benefit from rising interest rates because they have more assets than debts, the ones losing out from the rate mm. increase are actually younger, have a bit less income, but similar levels of home ownership um, and spending. So it's basically a tough demographic to be in if you're in your 30s uh, and <laughs> 40s because you might be in a kind of a similar situation in terms of the number of assets you have. Uh, most people who are in their 30s and 40s, especially if you're married and have children, of course, you're most likely to uh, be leasing or owning a home, uh, mostly with mortgages and loans, um, that's pretty not much different from people in their 40s and 50s uh, or older. Mm. Uh, but of course, um, they they tend to be spending more as well with a little bit more income. But because of these high interest rates, they don't have a lot more room to spend as well. So mm. it seems to be the phenomenon now with those who are actually able to spend are actually saving their money now mm. to spend later. But those who are earning 
um, sufficient amounts in the middle class are actually just cutting down spending altogether. Mm. Is that a memo to tell me to spend less? Because I'm definitely in that demographic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Likewise as well. So, yeah, I've certainly reduced my... Uh, consumption and spending in but recent years. But we've got to years. eat. <laughs> but we've got to eat, yes. So we don't want to eat anything, you know, untasty. <laughs> I think sense. I think that's a root of our problems for now because we, you know, I'm married but no kids and it just, yeah. I realize expenses for food and groceries is astronomical and I don't know where yeah. to cut corners without making my food taste less tasty. You're right. You know, you know I went grocery shopping yesterday at uh, <laughs> one of the kind of lesser expensive uh, discount chains and uh, I gasped at my Bill at the end of it, uh, yeah, yeah. the sum of my receipt. And uh, so, yeah, that's going to last me for about, uh, I think, a week or two, I think. <laughs> live and <laughs> learn, live and learn. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Underground Railway. So Seoul City is getting ready to move railways that currently run above ground to underground and then utilize land above for new projects. I guess that makes sense. Land is precious in Seoul City. Tell us the details. <laughs> Yeah, very scarce, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, they're trying to get as much land as they can uh, for a lot of infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, this is actually a follow up to a passage of what's known as the Special Act on the Underground Railroad by the National Assembly last month that will actually come into effect on January 31st next year. The city plans to order basic planning services in March and it plans to suggest its development ideas to the land ministry, the, so the central government, in the, centra, uh, in the second half of this year. Now, right now, there are six railway lines in Seoul that are above ground that spread across uh, about mm. 70 kilometers, uh, causing environmental pollution such as noise. So if you're living next to these kind of railways, of course, then uh, you'd be suffering from a lot of noise pollution as well. It's a, it's a sore uh, sight for the eyes as well, um, these kind of railways that are above ground. Now, Seoul's plan includes moving these railways underground and then using the space for uh, parks and cultural sites and shops and uh, commercial areas and rest areas. The city will also form a team with the 15 local areas that have these railways uh, passing through them to listen to what people living there think and want. Uh, it'll look at examples from around the world where cities have successfully moved railways underground and developed the land for public use. Now, when the land ministry's comprehensive plan uh, comes out, the Seoul Metropolitan Government will refer to it to establish a basic plan for each route and begin implementing the project for the capital city. All right, let's move on to our final keyword of the day. Mobile World Congress. So we're taking you to the world's largest mobile communications expo. The MWC 2024 is set to open on Monday in Barcelona. It is an annual trade show. What can we expect? Yeah, so it's a big one next to kind of, you know, the likes of CES and other kind of these tech and IT expos and forums. MWC primarily focuses on the wireless communication industry. However, it is expected to encompass a wide range of cutting uh, edge technologies in various fields, especially including artificial intelligence, the kind of the key highlights and key words of recent years. Now, this year's MWC, spanning four days, will host approximately 2,400 companies from over 200 com uh, countries. Maintaining the scale of the previous year, in fact, the event is expected to attract around 95,000 visitors, nearing pre-pandemic levels uh, seen in 2019. Now, while showcasing wireless communication technologies like 5G and IoT, the expo will also emphasize AI, cloud computing, mobility and fintech, uh, reflecting the kind of increasing integration of IT and communications technologies, especially notable this year, uh, is the expected prominence of AI fueled by the recent surge in generative AI interest sparked by things like chat GPT and other uh, sorts. Now, Korean companies are also making a strong showing at this year's MWC with 165 companies participating, making Korea the fifth most represented country. In fact, it'll not only feature large corporations like uh, SK Telecom, KT mm -hmm. and Samsung, but also promising startups um, 
um, as well. Now, even though MWC has traditionally been about mobile tech, there'll actually be a lack of new mobile device uh, announcements from big players like Apple and Samsung. That's kind of been a trend in recent years. They have their own kind of keynotes and announcements. Uh, Samsung has had their uh, one not so long ago, the mm. S24 series, uh, of which one I have bought already. And it's all been about AI rather than kind of the phone's technical features. Mm. Uh, however, Chinese companies are actually s expected to showcase their new smartphones. So they're kind of filling that kind of mm. void in that forum and uh, expo. Mm. Um, so we'll have to see. What, uh, and Chinese companies have actually been... Uh, catching up a lot to mm. the big market dominators uh, so they've dominated the market quite a lot of recent years so there's a lot of focus on what the chinese companies from mm. the likes of oneplus uh, uh, huawei and companies like that yeah. are, are showcasing as well there's not that much interest in chinese smartphones here in korea but um, in terms of uh, the Western market, there's still some quite a, a lot of interest uh, there as well. And potential there too, maybe with price competitiveness and a faster yeah. production cycles, but we'll have to wait and see. It's mm -hmm. just the beginning of MWC, the Mobile World Congress. Just when we thought we can't add more features to our smartphones, in came AI. Yeah, I mean, I, I bought a, uh, the S24 Ultra. I'm not trying to plug any particular mm. phone model, but it's all been about, they've been uh, highlighting their AI features and I've been uh, playing around with it and it's proven quite useful, actually, even for uh, our segment sometimes <laughs> as well. Does it help you get the work done? <laughs> a little bit, not okay. a lot, but I still have to write it eventually. I still prefer the, you know, <laughs> pulling up the sleeves and doing the typing myself kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna, for today's coverage. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. You're very welcome. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.